the Greys want a classic Sun Tzu takeover of a country is to win without any fighting whatsoever, without a shot being fired or an arrow being loosed. That's Sun Tzu who was writing about medieval warfare in ancient China. He was very big on psychological effects, tactics, and razzle-dazzle. Intimidate your enemy, get them to surrender without fighting, make them lose their morale, etc., etc. Welcome back. I'm here again with Dr. John Brandenburg. John, welcome. Sean, always a pleasure and honor to be on your show. And I'm just doing my job. Now, just doing my I think job. last last week we did an episode on the downside or the dark side. It's not really the downside. Yes. There, there really is only one way to go with it, but the, the dark side of disclosure. And yes. that video kind of caused quite a stir enough so that i think i have a lot more subscribers than i did last week so <laughs> if you joined us god, uh, god bless episode, you i you, yeah, you know welcome. i uh i'm just like i said i'm i'm just saying what i know or what i'm actually convinced of i've been watching this problem for almost 40 years and i've kept fairly quiet about it just concentrated on mars but now it's time to view mars as part of not only there's the UFO cover up and then there's the Mars cover up, and they're all part of what I call the ET cover up. And of course, the struggle is for ET disclosure the fact that we're not alone in the universe. And the second shoe, there's two boots on that one. The second boot is that, yes, just like on Earth, some people are nice and some people are not so nice out there. Now, for folks who just joined and never saw you in an interview with me other yes. than last week, could you just give a quick, brief background on your back? Uh, yes, on, brief on background. Yeah. I'm a theoretical, primarily theoretical plasma physicist. I've managed several experimental projects in plasma physics. Plasmas are the stuff of lightning bolts. The sun is, is a plasma. All the stars are plasma. The aurora borealis, it's electrified gas that conducts electricity like a metal. And most of the universe is in the plasma state, by the way, at least the part of the universe that we can actually visibly recognize. So it lends very quickly into astrophysics, the physics of stars. My major focus has been on controlled fusion in my career, but I I'm also an astrophysicist, and since plasmas deal with electromagnetism and astrophysics deals with gravity and electromagnetism, I've worked on unified field theory to unify gravity and E&M. I consider my major scientific quest. I've made a great pro great deal of progress on that. I've published the, the GEM unification theory, but I've always been working in national defense ever since 1975, and my parents... My father was a combat veteran of World War II. He was in the Army Air Force on a bomber. My uncles all were in the combat infantry on my mother's side. My family has been very much associated with national defense. My uncle, who inspired me to become a physicist, who was married to my father's sister, William Surrey, taught at Berkeley, and he worked on the Manhattan Project during World War II. So my entire background is for people who worked and risked their lives for national defense. And so I'm I'm a rather patriotic individual, and I just feel like I'm doing my job doing this. But plasmas lend themselves not only to astrophysics, but also to space propulsion, because the ultimate rocket exhaust is plasma. When the United States and China clash, the world will never be the same especially when forces beyond reality threaten to intervene. What if the United States went to war with the People's Republic of China? How would these rivals fight for supremacy on land, sea, air, and across the stochastic streams of time? What wonder weapons would be unleashed? What horrors would emerge from the irradiated sludge of the South China Sea? What heroes would rise and forever change the course of history? 
tread into the deepest and darkest dimensions of the multiverse, gaze through a kaleidoscope of fractured realities, and bear witness to the disturbing visions of World War III from today's greatest minds in science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Weird World War, China. Available now from Bain Books at Bain.com. So I've worked on all of those things, and I've had a lot of success professionally. And one of my rocket engines that I invented is now flying in space, it uses the MET thruster, it uses microwaves to ionize, make a plasma out of water vapor and squirt it out of a nozzle. That's uh, used in space propulsion. It's been demonstrated now successfully. And so I'm also the father of three children, and I have two grandchildren. I've been very blessed that way. They're my finest achievements, all of them. So I'm here to serve. Now, the information that you put out in the last episode, namely that Greys have been here for a while, that yes. you want to keep this quiet. And Greys, you know, allegedly are one species of several, but these are the ones yes. that want to keep disclosure because according to what you learned through the course of your 40-year career, yes. 15 years in Washington, D.C., you have contacts that have told you over the years that they are indeed a threat, and yes. they want to keep this quiet because they want to work on a hybridization kind of crossover. With the, the Greys do. They The Greys want a classic Sun Tzu takeover of a country is to win without any fighting whatsoever, without a shot being fired or an arrow being loosed. That's Sun Tzu who was writing about medieval warfare in ancient China. He was very big on psychological effects, tactics, and razzle-dazzle. Intimidate your enemy, get them to surrender without fighting, make them lose their morale, etc., etc. However, I'm also a student of von Clausewitz, The Art of War in the West, which was written by a guy who fought Napoleon, and you couldn't apply psychological effects to Napoleon. He was too psychologically savvy and too tough. All he cared about was artillery, infantry, and cavalry. Let's get a size of the N of kind of, without going into too much detail, you've heard a number of people tell you yes. these things over the years. Yes. Is this one person? Is this 40 people? Is it hundreds of people? What's the... I would say, uh, you know, roughly about... I've learned these things from people who were on the, at least the insides sort of the inside of the ufo cover-up they didn't even know how far they were inside they said it's you know basically an onion they were in the outer layers they would report to people who knew even more than they did and for all they knew they were reporting to even people who knew even more so there was a core surrounded by layers of secrecy and that's how you run classified programs you run them on need to know you right. give people just enough knowledge to do their job. And if it wasn't such a kind of tragic situation that we're dealing with now, I'd say good job. To advertise on Through Glass Darkly, email Through Glass Darkly ads at gmail.com. So I worked in Washington, D.C. for 15 years. I worked with the Pentagon, the military services, intelligences, and I worked primarily on space intelligence and also with the agencies. And I heard a great deal because of my work on Mars. They seem to want to confide in me. I then wrote a science fiction novel. I, I sort of asked permission to write a science fiction novel of using some of the things that I'd heard around the water cooler and near the coffee machine. But is this like one person or is it a handful or is it more than a handful? That's all I'm trying to do. Uh, I, I would say about uh, maybe a double handful, you know? Okay. okay. I, I can't. No, that's helpful. I, I would learn things from one group of people and then they'd yeah, be collaborated by others. It, 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 was, yeah. it was all, I, I wasn't taking notes on this thing because th as far as I was concerned, these were reports and scuttlebutt almost but it was so what you do with a noisy signal if you're trying to do electronic intelligence if you get a signal that's very repetitive you can keep summing it and finally you get an idea of the basic message 
And so combination of rumen, concrete statements by certain people from various sources, and also my experience in the Mars, part of the ET cover-up. So I learned a lot, but I was never formally part of the program. I was never read into the program. There's a saying on Wall Street that those who know don't say, and those who say don't know. I'm in the very odd category of being able to say some things that I know. And part of that is because I was never read into these programs. And I view that I'm seeing to the nation's and humanity's defense in making these statements that I'm making now. Now, what's the probability, I mean, if you just had to assess it, that this is real, i.e., is it is there a s- probability that you were fed misinformation in any way? Oh, some of the information I got may have been disinformation. I was on guard for that. And mm-hmm. I feel like on some occasions, people would tell me stuff that I knew contradicted other stuff that I'd been hearing from people. And it was almost like they had been said to go tell Brandenburg this. <laughs> Just to (laughs) To balance out what you were told. To balance out what I was told. And, you know, it's intelligence work. And it's like Roachford before the Battle of Midway. They finally got it down to what is the identity of AF? And then they finally figured out, okay, send up a report in the open that AF is running out of water. And the Japanese, they could only break 10% of the Japanese code, but they were able to break that part and realize that The target for AF, which was the big operation target for the Japanese, was Midway. And so you have to develop a kind of instinct for these things. And everything I'm basically saying, I have very high confidence. I so one thing one thing I did do is I wrote a science fiction novel where I put a lot of these ideas in the science fiction novel, especially the very crucial ones. But and, by the way, you did it. You did it under a nom de guerre. What was the, yeah, what was uh, yeah, Victor Norgard. I wrote it under. So a you can find name. that on Amazon if you look for the novels. If they look at yes. the random. And so I wrote a. Uh, I I wrote right. the collapse of the UFO cover up, the aftermath of the UFO cover up in two sequels. One was to rule a night, the UFO war. It triggers a war with the Greys, and the third one is Morning Star Rising, and that is where we invade the moon, the U.S. and its allies which is pretty much a wall-to-wall alliance of the human race. And we invade the moon and turn this thing into a ground war. So I wargamed the entire set of possibilities, kind of mentally writing those novels. And I took everything that I had learned from basically reports that I had heard, both in, out in the open and also stuff I'd just heard by the water cooler, and put that in there. I actually asked people, I'd like to write some science fiction and use some of the interesting stuff I heard here around the water cooler or the coffee machine. And to my surprise, they said, John, we always like your reports. They actually said that. We always like your reports. <laughs> Why don't you write that novel? It's just call it science fiction, they said. Mm-hmm. Make sure you call it science fiction. And so I did, and I talked to some of them later, and they'd read it, and they really liked it. They said, how did you get so much stuff right? And I said, well, I just was connecting dots. I guess I'm just a good guesser. I said, well, they said, well, you got a lot of stuff right. They wouldn't go down a list of stuff I got right. But I had people, for what instance, when I was working in D.C., in a different agency where I had a big, big security clearance, And this guy came to me at my office, and he says, you know, I've been talking to some people who are dealing with aliens from outer space, he says. And he says, they're worried because there are people down here on this planet that they think are aliens, but they can't tell them from human beings. I was actually going to ask you that. You were talking about hybridization. Are there any, according according to what you heard? Well, so I was writing the novel at the time. And I came upon the idea of using sniffer dogs, trained German shepherds that would sniff out extraterrestrials from a bunch of human beings. And they look just like us. 
and acted just like us. And the dogs could tell who was from this planet and who wasn't. And believe it or not, he came back to me two weeks later, came back to my office and says, you know, I told the people I was talking to about that. And they love the idea and they're trying it. <laughs> so so I, that was, that's kind of some of the exchanges I had with these people. Uh, so when they use these sniffer dogs, what would have been the mechanism, at least in your novel? Was it because they'd been off planet, or is there just something different about their DNA that they? Well, their DNA is slightly so, there is different enough, but there are many in the novel I put in there because of the folklore is that these people came down and would zoom Earth women and have children with them, and those children, like in the Greek legends, became great heroes. And so I decided there must be a population out there in the stars that is genetically compatible with human beings. And that's a quite fascinating thing. Imagine that the human race was genetically engineered by some very super race to live on this planet. Imagine that. And we're a very practical looking creature. And then imagine that they did the same thing on several other Earth-like planets. And those people started coming here in spaceships because they developed earlier than we did. And so you could have a whole kind of gene spore that is super terrestrial that's basically human and is genetically compatible. They can have children. And of course, that was a feature in a lot of science fiction like Star Trek, like Spock, for instance. He was half Vulcan. Uh, anyway, it was an interesting way to kind of take, I mean, it's even in the Bible in Genesis chapter 6, where it says, the sons of God saw that the daughters of earth were very beautiful. And, and it said, the offspring of these unions were great men about whom many legends are written. That's in the Bible. I am a Christian. I'm just an Episcopalian, but I grew up in a very religious household, so I learned the Bible. And it was fascinating to basically realize that if you looked at that verse as the sons of God, they don't identify them as being uh, extraterrestrials that were very human, humanoid, then it would explain the other folklore in the Greco-Roman mythology about gods coming down and having children by earth with women, and those guys becoming great heroes. I mean, very validating. It doesn't validate in detail, but it does validate as a main concept. One of the things you have to give up when you deal with business like this is precise knowledge about anything. Everything is, you kind of get a basic idea of something. And then, because things are complex, like the identity of the grays. Are they from Zeta Reticuli? I don't know. Are all of the grays hostile to us or just some of them? Are they clones, of, you know, worker ants for some insect society? I don't know. You basically have to assume that Earth is not an aberration on the cosmos, and the same diversity in biosphere on Earth is also reflected in stars. And it means the universe is a complex place, but at the same time, as a scientist, Einstein had a great phrase. He says, Seek simplicity and then distrust it. Look for the simplest explanation for something, but then realize that the universe is a complex place and there's probably exceptions to this and there's other details that you don't understand, et cetera, et cetera. So am I answering your question, Sean? I may, I may have wandered afar from your yeah, original so, question. So, so are there, according to what you've heard of there, hybrids on earth but uh, yes both friendly, well, the, uh, the, the, by the way, friendly versus unfriendly there are different types of hybrids there's hybrids like spock who are basically the offspring of unions between very humanoid extraterrestrials and earth people then there are hybrids with the grays who are basically apparently an insectoid physiology they may have a copper blood pigment. In fact, they, they will put that in Star Trek, that Spock's blood was actually copper-based rather than iron-based, because that's a system that 
is used on earth for octopi and large insects, especially spiders, use copper-based pigment instead of iron-based. And it would explain their gray color. They're not pink, they're gray. And so what you come to the conclusion that the universe is a complicated place. There may be some people down here who are very humanoid, like people supposedly reportedly from Lyra, the region in the sky of the constellation Lyra, or the Pleiades. And the people from Lyra and the Pleiades are reportedly basically just human beings. They behave like human beings, and they tend to be really nice to people. Then you have the greys, who treat us like dirt, and are completely physiologically different than us. And if they're trying to hybridize with human beings, the resulting hybrid is probably not very healthy. It would take a lot of work to make a hybrid between a gray, which is basically kind of an insectoid genome, and a mammal genome like ourselves. And those are the reports that the people who've seen some of these hybrids say they're really sickly and weak. And so I'm just saying things can be complicated. When I say hybrids, I mean the grays, gray human hybrids. I don't mean terrestrial Pleiadian or terrestrial Lyran hybrids. Those are just mixed marriages, results of mixed marriages, you know, I'm just, so do you, can you understand that? The idea that there's some people who, the greys yeah, are not trying simple. to, it's, yeah, not it's not simple. simple. It's not right. simple. If you saw a hybrid with the gray walking around on earth, you'd probably immediately recognize it as kind of a gray. But if you see Spock, you don't, except for his pointed ears, which could be, you know, surgically altered if they wanted. You don't notice them being, especially given the diversity of the human race, he wouldn't stand out in a crowd in New York City in Times Square, you know, but a gray hybrid would. And you don't see them walking down the street. So the person who came and talked to me about this problem of spotting very humanoid hybrids or, or, or he didn't speak of them as high he didn't speak of them as hybrids he said these are real extraterrestrials who look mm -hmm. just like us and people are worried they're going to get security clearances and <laughs> be working at the pentagon and stuff like this do these and, hybrids uh, know they're hybrids in all cases or there's some cases where they don't know oh there's the, the sciences of manipulating people's brains is, you know, becoming quite advanced. It, it's always been there, by the way. If you kind of program people to feel a certain way from childhood, then they'll do that. And so it's a complex situation. And I believe the person I was talking to was talking about people who looked and acted just like regular human beings, but weren't from here. And that was the concern. Mm -hmm. And I've since heard other reports that this is true. And so I even put it in the novel. Uh, in fact, there's one. But anyway, so I, I tried to put things like that in the novels so that people would understand that the universe is complicated and it's a complicated situation. I mean, if you're in Luxembourg and a German has infiltrated your government in Luxembourg, how are you going to know that he's not really right. from Luxembourg, he's from Germany, and etc. So it's a complex situation. And because it's complex, it's very difficult to get a precise idea as to what is going on. Some people have asked me, you know, what is the probability of this? What is the probability of that? And you think of a bunch of normal curves, you know, you kind of try to hit the centroid of the normal curve mm -hmm. instead of out a couple sigmas out and, you know, sigmas being the, you know, standard deviations out. But that's the best you can do, I think. So anyway, please. Yeah. So, so I, I, another question. It actually sounds pretty cryptic to me, but uh, my 
source is telling me you understand this. So Cy War 1947 just says pass this to Brandon Word. You'll understand. Uh, I don't know what I'm certainly familiar with the term Cy War, but I'm I don't think I'm familiar with that as a work of fiction. The uh, well, I don't know if it's a work of fiction. It could be something related to some incident or something. I don't know. Oh well, people who have been abducted by especially the Greys report that they're sort of drugged all the time when they're on the gray ships and they it's very difficult for them to figure out what is really happening and what is not real you know it's like they're in a partial dream state so one of the things i did was when i wrote the science fiction novel morning star past the collapse and ufo cover-up i was trying to wrap my head around the whole cover-up situation while i was writing it and I'm a writer. I love my characters and all this stuff like this. But I wanted to see the reaction of the people I knew who knew a lot more about it than I did. And their reactions were very positive. One person said, I'm amazed how much stuff you got right. You know, he, he knew that I didn't know anything in detail, but somehow I managed to put a bunch of details in the novel that he recognized as being true. The one character who we know is associated with the inner workings of the UFO cover-up is Hal Putoff. He's a brilliant physicist. He's he, they refer to him as the owl in the aviary, right? They do? Oh, I was actually part of the aviary, and I was just, suddenly I was on this email group, and somebody said, was in the email group and said, oh, I'm not part of the aviary, and I said, tweet for yourself, <laughs> because... <laughs> If you're on this email group, you're a part of the, and it was basically an informal think tank that people from the various agencies had put together, and I was kind of honored to be part of it. So I would just make comments. And I think one of the things they did was use me as kind of, well, this is somebody who doesn't know anything. How much can he figure out just based on the fragmentary information that he's gotten? But anyway, like I said, the people I knew who were on the inside, at least in the outer layers, praised the novel, saying it was highly accurate. And the novel is, by the way, quite noir. So they're saying, yes, the situation is as bad as you have depicted it. <laughs> now, you had mentioned in our prior interview about magnetometers. Yes. And you said they're easy to make. So, oh, they are. Without getting they have very sensitive magnetic. What's that? In, without getting into too much detail, if someone wanted to say go to Home Depot or Lowe's or a place like that and get the components or fries, that's probably more likely. Fries. The West Coast. Well, I'm really glad that, yeah, I've visited some fries. I don't know. I've never built one myself. I would just order one from Amazon. They're on Amazon. And is there any particular, well, first of all, roughly- I don't know what the manufacturer is, and I, I certainly don't have any deal with them to push their product, but I've heard that their stuff is good. You can go on Amazon, look for a UFO detector magnetometer, and it'll pop up, and it's like $135. And it's and is all assembled. You, then there's, there you can buy even kits that are like, if you like to build your own stuff, you can buy kits. To build them now do they all tune to a similar frequency or do you need to buy a model that is tuned to a particular uh, frequency i think of, they're of i think they're they tend to be broadband they're looking for fairly low frequency magnetic field variations you can imagine the simplest magnetometer is just a compass needle Mm -hmm. with a mirror on it that you detect the photocell detects when it's vibrating if the needle starts vibrating it means that there's a local magnetic source that's very powerful that's changing so the you Earth's could magnet. probably you could probably rig up you probably make an app actually the person who asked me this question is a software developer so, oh well uh, our telephones so, so i'm not going to say his name because he's very shy but he could probably sure, sure. easily write an app because you have a compass. If you have a compass on your phone, then you have some yes, sort of... Yes, exactly. You could write an app to monitor that compass. You've got a okay. magnetometer in your phone is right. your compass. 
And will, it, could, will, it, will it be sensitive enough to detect? You, I think you were talking about 30 hertz frequencies. 30 uh, hertz, range. yeah. That's fairly low frequency. That's a compass needle vibrating. You can see it vibrating, but it's still vibrating pretty slow. So, yeah. And once you realize, okay, they need electromagnetism to fly, and you can detect that. Can you imagine what would happen if there was disclosure and everybody was issued magnetometers? Yeah, you'd have Bubba on his back porch in rural Ohio absolutely rifle shots into the sky when these things i don't know if it would penetrate the, the oh the no oh, they, they would penetrate <laughs> they would penetrate They're, these things are the things so, are made so what, what, what would they do just you know rig up some sort of high-powered microwave can you do that oh yeah i could build one yeah we probably shouldn't talk to I, <laughs> yeah i don't want to get because don't do this at home and that don't do yeah. this at home kids you're going to have people, uh, it's like, you're going to have people inadvertently causing other people to get Havana syndrome and stuff like that. It's not smart. Oh, 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 exactly. But you give me a satellite dish and I could make a nice microwave beamer that would be good for a few miles. So this and is something if the government decided to disclose. This is something that. If oh yeah, not the novel. If there weren't, if there were not, if there were not an immediate attack, people could at least start self-organizing. Oh yeah, and the parts are available at Fry's, I believe, to build these things. So everyone could just rush down to Fry's and build them. And you know, a good electrical engineer could figure out how to do it. He wouldn't even need sophisticated components. If you just make the big loop of wire wide. So it has a lot of collection area. It, it doesn't fit in your phone anymore, but you care about something in your house. So you can sit on the back porch with a high-powered rifle. And if you could imagine that jet fighters would carry these. And so you have combat air patrol by National Guard and Air Force and the Navy near the coast. And then you have everybody's got magnetometers. And they're waiting for them. In, in my novel... <laughs> I'll just say the aliens don't change their tactics <laughs> after this coach. So they lose a whole bunch of ships. They don't change their algorithm, even though everything has changed. Now, what kind of weapons do they have? Oh, directed energy weapons, proton beams. You know, I worked on directed energy weapon, electron beams, firing them through the atmosphere. That can be done. And, so, uh, so is this something if, if let's say there was widespread disclosure, yes, and they decided they wanted to atomize an aircraft carrier? Is that something within their capability? They could certainly damage one. The little tic tacs flying around. I don't think they could do any harm to an aircraft carrier, especially if they're dodging twenty millimeter. In my novel, by the way, they put magnetometers in twenty millimeter, finally down to fifty caliber has magnetometers in and what they do is they don't try and hit the ships they just try and blow up near them to sh shoot a bunch of shrapnel through them and the ships are basically made of tin foil the shrapnel shreds them and then they can't go back into space because they right. can't hold air and so if you don't damage them crucially they still end up crashing because they can't go back to the moon where they are based and what they also do is they figure out where all the bases are on Earth and attack those with just infantry and armor and artillery. And they find the ones even under the sea and drop big depth charges on them. So it turns into a real mess. They had a whole set of algorithms for a very, very stealthy takeover. But they don't have the muscle is what you're they, saying. They don't have the muscle for a big fight. They didn't because, you know. It's a lot cheaper to run a stealthy takeover without a shot being fired. But if you got to fire a whole bunch of shots, that requires big resources, big fleets, and that attracts the attention of the other powers. You can't keep that quiet. And so you very quickly end up in a situation where basically the, the ante in the poker game has gone way up. And you've all, for one thing, you've forced them off the optimal Sun Tzu method of war, which is razzle-dazzle and not a shot being fired 
terror and intimidation. And so suddenly you force them off of that very optimal path, taking over without a shot being fired with the government's inadvertent cooperation. And so suddenly they've kicked over the chess game. You know, the chess game is kicked over. You're now playing a real poker game here. And the ante, the starting ante is $500 to sit down. And if you don't have $500, then you can't play very well. And, you know, there's the American reaction. Then there's the reaction of these other powers, like especially the Russians in my novel. They, <laughs> they have a much less sophisticated view of the politics of this situation. And they also have very sophisticated technologies themselves. And in fact, they develop a whole set of technologies to take down alien ships that the Americans didn't even think of because they're Russians. I'm not now, saying the Russians are a bunch of Boy Scouts, but they are very smart. Now, given the context that you've had, yes, how long has this been or this program been running, and what are their relative numbers to the extent that that's even available? Estimate of enemy forces. I think they have only brought enough forces to the solar system that they think they can handle the Sun Tzu thing. And if things go south, you end up with a real shooting war. They don't want the war to go nuclear, by the way, because that would destroy the Earth. Mm -hmm. They want to capture the Earth. They want to capture the human race intact. If it's all radioactive wasteland on Earth, then that means they've lost, they've invested 80 years for nothing. That means they've lost a lot of people for nothing. So they want the war, if they do decide to uh, basically start making overt hostile actions, they'll try and calibrate those to avoid a nuclear war and just wear down the human race psychologically. But at the same time, I don't think, I mean, there's 8 billion human beings. And uh, if you combine the really advanced nations on Earth, there's, you know, roughly 2 billion people who are willing to fight to the death and who are technologically very advanced, who are willing to fight to the death to prevent the Greys from taking over. And I think that makes that impossible. And if the Greys are really smart, they will decide to fold. Mm -hmm. The poker game is too rich for their blood. They will fold and leave. That would be a truly intelligent thing for them to do. They'll just say, oh, we invested 80 years here. We lost a lot of ships, a lot of people. But the cost of continuing this has become excessive. We have to stop it. During the Cold War, the Russians had very elaborate schemes to try and undermine American life. They partly succeeded during the Vietnam War. But they found out there was a big Russian plan to tap into all of our long-distance calls and develop dossiers on all Americans. They had large numbers of people learning English and then listening to American phone calls and writing stuff into forums in Russian and putting that in a big database so they could basically blackmail Americans individually. <laughs> and, you know, and then when we found out about it, we just scrambled all the signals on the long distance microwave beams between the microwave towers. And it was all for nothing. Then They couldn't get any more information. And, you know, the information they had was not worthless, but they weren't anywhere close to being able to blackmail the entire population of the United States individually. You know, it was so, a crazy so idea. Like, so it sounds like this program has been ongoing for about 80 years. And yeah, about 80 like years. Yes. About since Roswell, factor. since about 1942, probably was when the Greys first arrived. I view the Greys as kind of a recent arrival, where some of these peoples have been around for a long, long time, especially the ones that look very human. They have been around for a long time, thousands of years at least. And in fact, the reason we are the way we are is probably because there was a lot of shore leave. The appearance of Cro-Magnon man is very sudden, and he took over from the Neanderthals. 
we all have some Neanderthal genes in the meantime anyway. That's the way things go. But I think the greys are fairly recent. They're supposedly come from Zeta Reticuli. That's 40 light years from here. And their arrival corresponds to roughly them detecting the first starts of radio broadcasting on Earth. Began in about 1900. And if you take that they started, by the time there was some serious radio broadcasting going on that they could pick up. Yeah, it was about 40 years to get to Zeta Reticuli. Then they had faster than light travel, so they could come here. And what happened when they came here? We were involved in a world war, and we were in a very bad mood. And they lost some ships due to quite primitive human weapons. And basically all they did was startle people. Then, of course, the Roswell thing happened, and everybody knows what was at Roswell now. It was all the nuclear weapons on Earth were stored there. And I know that because I talked to some people who worked at Roswell when this all happened. And so then Roswell happened. They lost two ships at Roswell in one night, apparently to a combat air patrol by P-61 Black Widows, which were the American night fighter at the time. These were World War II veteran crews, expert at night fighting. And they had a big radar in the nose of the thing and 450 calibers in a roof turret and four 20 millimeter cannons on the base of the plane. They could rip any plane to shreds. They were shooting down Falk Wolves and German night fighters. And then, of course, the Japanese night fighters didn't have good radar, so they were just shredded. So these people were very good. And if you check, You'll find out that in about May, just before Roswell, Roswell happened in June. It happened, in fact, on the weekend of July 4th, roughly. In June and May time frame, there was a big surge in UFO sightings, and they pulled all of the night fighter squadrons, the P-61s. They pulled them out of Europe, they pulled them out of the Far East, and they brought them to the United States. You can check that. So then they had arrived. And that coincided with the Cold War, basically getting very, very intense. And what was the response of the United States and the Soviet Union was to immediately, with crash programs, make as many nuclear weapons as they could. And according to Philip Corso, both sides were making huge stockpiles of nuclear weapons with delivery vehicles for them, not just because they didn't like each other, you know, Joe Stalin was still in charge then, but because they feared an alien invasion, both the Russians and the Americans, and they had an under the table agreement that they would be in an alliance. And it was just after World War II. We'd been allies during World War II. So they had a, a secret agreement between the Soviet Union and the United States that we would together form an alliance to repel any alien invasion. And we wanted as many nuclear weapons as possible in both stockpiles. There's a saying in Dune that he who can destroy a thing can control a thing. If we can destroy the earth ourselves, that means we can control it. No one can have it. They try and take it from us. And look, I have never in the military. I didn't graduate from West Point. But even I know that is not a very good military strategy for winning wars to blow yourself up. But If it deters an alien invasion, which it apparently did, then it works. Now, later, apparently, according to reports, we had agreements with various groups of aliens. Eisenhower may have met with them, and the story goes that he met with some extremely humanoid aliens, and they wanted us to give up our nuclear weapons, and he didn't. (laughs) Obviously, he he politely declined. He politely declined. Then the story I heard is that our big problem was the Greys, and they were buzzing over Washington, D.C. after Roswell. In 1952, there were mass flights of UFOs over the Capitol, and Harry Truman was still in charge. And the government sort of said, what UFOs, basically? And then suddenly they made an announcement. We will shoot on sight any unidentified aircraft. And the report I heard was 
they early jet fighters they did get a ufo in the sights for the golden three seconds and blew a chunk off of one which was an interesting composite it, it was full of beads of some kind of silicon based stuff in a metal matrix they collected the fragments and hit the ground and strangely enough strangely enough by coincidence all the ufo sightings over dc stock after that incident so we sent them a message i grew up in a rough town i just grew up in a logging town and i got in two brawls in high school and you know you had to be constantly ready for a little bit of violence and sometimes it would just you could settle things with just some good shoving if you won the shoving match the guy would uh, decide not to be interested in you anymore people were bullying people and you know if you stood up to the bullies they they would go find somebody who could be bullied easier etc cetera, etc cetera. so the ufo flights over washington dc looked like a classic geopolitical intimidation you know we're demonstrating all this air power you can't touch us but then of course we touched them <laughs> and so, guess what so they, what's, they, what's what's holding back disclosure then uh, yeah, and, then, well, and then i'll lead to my next question well i think disclosure would be a great step into the unknown they don't know what would happen well i mean they don't know what they're doing anyway so you might as well roll the dice well you got four million people flooding through the border you got inflation oh you know it's we come have, down, but you still have inflation you have all sorts of we have a policies, we have right? a very dysfunctional government what did yeah. ronnie reagan do well you know i heard this reliably from several sources there was a clash on the ground in fact in an underground base with the aliens where 60 people got killed and an unknown number of aliens got killed and is a place called dulce and i talked to one guy who was very knowledgeable and he said that from his network he'd heard three different versions of the story and the only thing that was really basically different between the stories was the body count for each side so is this, he this is, the, is this the phil the phil schneider story yes the dear departed phil schneider who basically said that he was approached by the government told to shut up and then suddenly committed suicide with piano wire or something like this the uh, circumstances of his death are not by the way by the way you never you haven't met him in person no i've never met him in person all right good so he's never given you a rock has he no 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 one apparently has given me any apparently apparently he used to sleep on slightly radioactive rocks and he used to hand them out at various conventions and people were told if you've ever received a rock from phil schneider get a geiger uh, counter and check it yeah well it was, it, it, there was uh, you know i'm not saying the story's not true i don't know but there's I, a little I, I talked to people he was a little he was a little uh, off center let's just say he's a little, a little off, off center. center well right being if you know a reality that you can't really explain to everybody else yeah that's fair that's fair then you're gonna, you're it, gonna, it kind gonna, of warps your mind eventually yeah you might check your, your you might check yourself off the ranch at some point you know, uh, exactly you yourself, but, yeah. uh, well there's an example of a fellow who discovered that germs were that the surgeries they were doing on people were giving them infections because they weren't sanitizing their hands with these you know this is a civil war type surgery and he knew about the theory of microbes which no one could see but a lot of people didn't believe in microbes right. they said you're imagining things and he says no there are these little bugs that live on your hands and you're putting them inside people and it's giving them infections when you operate on them you have to sanitize your hands and no one would listen to him and he went insane yeah he spent his la last years of his life kind of insane and he was proved right but he suddenly became aware of this horror story that was going on in every hospital yeah, and no one's idiots listen. just doing doing the same thing over and over and over oh, and over oh yeah again. and the, yeah. the human the human race loves routine if, if they've got something that seems yeah. to be working they don't want 
a dramatic change. And yeah, that, that was like me working in corporate. Like I would just see something that was like black and white, obvious solution. And it would take six months to get people oh. to understand the reality of the situation. And by then you'd have to lay off twice as many people. It was really frustrating. I, I get uh, it. I, anyway, sorry. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, I think that the organization that's been running the UFO cover up is very resistant to disclosure because it would mean a dramatic change from what they're doing. And if you're running an organization for a long time, according to a certain algorithm, you don't want to change it. Yeah, it's the iron law of bureaucracy. It's Jeffrey Purnell. <laughs> oh, what's concept. what's that? What's the iron law? Of oh, so, so, so Jeffrey Purnell is the science fiction author. He's also a former U.S. Army artilleryman. Uh, uh -huh. Also PhD. Also PhD. Cornell. No, I've heard. I I I believe he does. He write science fiction. Yeah, he wrote Lucifer's Hammer as one of many. Oh, many okay. Books. So his Iron Law of Bureaucracy says that when a bureaucracy is initially formed, it's formed to solve or confront a certain problem or issue. Yeah, and it's filled primarily with the people who are concerned with solving that problem or issue. Over time. There are people who join the organization, right? So there's the early adopters and there's the imitators. This is my language, and this this is this is uh, Purnell's. I'm, I'm mixing. I'm, I'm no, it's not Purnell's language. I'm, I'm just mixing different. I'm talking about bass diffusion curves right now. If you in marketing, <laughs> you might understand. Well, actually, marketers bass diffusion. Be that sounds. Uh, you know, I'm just a theoretical physicist. You know, I. <laughs> You yeah, can give me a, ba math a, ba a, ba a, a bass diffusion curve is a, is a simple S curve. People in marketing should know what it means. Oh, but okay. I found it's in my a experience, simple S curve. Okay, yeah. Yeah, okay. But, but in my experience, I found that none of them know what it means, even though they should. But, but it's like bass diffusion. You have early adopters and you have imitators after the early adopters. So anyway, similar to that, you have the people who solve the problem. Yes. And then you have people who administer the bureaucracy. Over time, just like the, the imitators, they begin to make up a larger and larger percentage of the organization such that by the time that the bureaucracy achieves significant scale, the people who exist for the preservation of the bureaucracy far outnumber and crowd out the people who are solving the problem. And that's why you get like the Department of Education, right? It doesn't really do anything useful. But it's just this massive bureaucracy that just vacuums up tax dollars and, you know, argues that if you get rid of us, everything will explode. You'll have, you know, the education system oh. will, you know, as if the education system in the United States is good, you know, <laughs> great as it is. But anyway, that's that's well, the we're kind both of the product of it. But but Sean, I want to point. I out went to private school my entire life, my friend. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, so I'm not. You know, your point about the S-curve and everything like this, very well right. taken. It is for that reason that I have urged, and I've gotten in arguments with people, not on the air, but at least privately, that I said we ought to offer a blanket pardon to everybody involved in the UFO cover-up. I would uh, have said that a year ago. They had a year. <laughs> I'll be the first one to line them up. Well, it's sort of like surrender, you'll be well treated. <laughs> you surrender yeah, actually i didn't say I, 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 yeah i was yeah i i think i think last year was the time to do that and i think we've i think we've passed that i think it's well i i'll tell you that, that i i was in washington dc when the cold war ended and that you know we won the cold war and it was a catastrophe for beltway contractors like me and i was simultaneously delighted that we'd won the cold war but then Everybody started losing their jobs because the Reagan mm -hmm. defense buildup just ended. Fortunately, I'd become a space cadet and people derided me. They said, Brandenburg, if you were really serious, you'd study, you know, uh, nuclear weapons effects, stuff like this, you know, and you're a space cadet. You know, you're interested in outer space and stuff like this. And I'd gotten that way because of Mars. But those people all lost their jobs. They had to retire a lot of them just because... Mm -hmm. The government wasn't interested in nuclear weapon effects anymore. It was interested in space surveillance to guarantee that the treaties we were going to put into place at the end of the Cold War were being followed. So I can tell you what it looked like to go through a dramatic change like that, where everything changed. 
And, you know, I can understand why some people would say, oh, no, we want the Cold War to go on as long as possible, <laughs> at least until I can retire. So, yeah, there's th th those are the, the same people who kept signing up countries to for NATO. Uh, oh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. How are we going to defend Estonia, Lithuania and Latvia? For yeah, instance? Russia will be fine. They'll even ask to join and we'll say no. And we'll just keep pushing the border. Closer to their near abroad, and they'll be safe because it's you know we're the good guys. Come on, I yeah. Anyway, I, sorry. I didn't, I didn't anyway, mean that so the your, your bureaucracy develops an inertia, and we're dealing with a classic bureaucracy. It's deep black bureaucracy, but it's just a bureaucracy. And no disclosure means radical change, and that's anathema to a good bureaucrat. So I understand that, but it's going to have to change anyway. Once you find evidence for in one meteorite of microbes, then you realize it, 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 one of these, they found it in meteorites that date from the primordial foundation of the solar system. This is, indicates panspermia. The fact that life on Earth, life on Mars began very early, as soon as there was a liquid ocean, apparently spores fell from space. Once you find life in a meteorite, then you know it's in the stars. That the whole universe is full of life. And we have a dead civilization on Mars with a thermonuclear holocaust. That basically shows that the law of the jungle applies out in the cosmos, just like it does on Earth. And we have the UFO cover-up at Earth. They can't keep this up. They're basically trying to put up a sheet metal roof over the entire night sky and say it's not there anymore. The stars are oh, just... It's more, it, it's more like the ostrich, proverbial ostrich. Putting uh, it is, it is. And he's got to stick his head deeper and deeper down into the sand. And so this can't continue. But so I advocate, okay, give everybody a blanket pardon. They were just following orders. They claim, okay, some bad stuff happened. Bad stuff. I understand that. But You're kinder, John. I what? would... I would I, you're kinder than I am. I would feed them to the survivors of this future conflict. <laughs> well, I'm I, I can understand why you feel like that, but I want the cover-up to end as quickly as possible. And I want to know as much as possible about what happened. And this is the... So, if, so to get everybody to turn that? states... What's that? So how can we do that without the government? I'm serious, because that's, that's, oh, that's, well, that's, I, that's I my path we just, forward. We're, we're doing it right now, Sean. We're doing yeah. it right now. I'm a PhD physicist who spent most of his career working on, you know, microwave plasmas and things like this. I've published a bunch of stuff. I've got a great theory of unifying the Einstein problem, unifying gravity and electromagnetism. It's been published. It's got good numbers. I took it to a string theory conference, and they paid me the ultimate compliment at the string theory conference. They got angry with me. Because I could calculate big G, the Newton gravitation constant, and they can't do that. And I calculated part per thousand. I, I calculated the mass of the proton from what's called the Planck mass, which is this quantum mass that appears and disappears. And their response was to get angry with me. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay. It, by the way, science in the big leagues like this is like basketball. It's not supposed to be a contact sport. But under the net, in a championship game with a close score, the knees and the elbows start flying. I remember Kareem Abdul-Jabbar had to wear goggles because people kept sticking their fingers in his eyes. It was amazing how that would happen in these games. So he had to wear goggles because he was the best shooter. And people didn't want him to shoot. And so anyway, so I'm just saying the unified field theory I developed, which I consider as my major life work, says that, yes, you can change gravity with electromagnetism. And you can make a flying craft that consists of a disc with three bumps on the bottom, with Tesla rotating three-phase power. And just like how many different shapes of airplanes are there, you can also, you know, you could come up with a whole bunch of different stuff. But that's the basic shape. And so I think the time has come for it to end. And Have you been given any informal nudges to start pushing this now? No, no, I have not. Basically, 
Have you um, been get, gotten any informal feedback or threats after coming out? I had this? one fellow who said he didn't like that I shouldn't link the stuff we found on Mars with the UFO cover-up. And that's fair. That's fair. I, I, you know, of, of course, they're two different kettles of fish. And actually, right. actually, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. What, uh, what, what that person is trying whoever to did whatever. Is, what's that? What that person is the advice that person's probably trying to give you is people can only tolerate so much at any one yes. given time. And yes, if you they throw can. the kitchen sink at them. It'll be harder to convince them of the former if you also try to convince them of the latter at the same time. Being as I've worked with high security clearances in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere, I came up with one great idea. And it, as part of a science fiction story. And gosh, I realized I could build one of these things. So I built it. We got money from the government to build it. It worked. And we got more money. I probably, it all told, got about a million dollars worth of contract money from the government uh, to work on this idea. And we got better and better at it. And th then I got a tap on the shoulder. I got a visit from one of the services, the Air Force, and they said, we don't want you working on this anymore. <laughs> or we'll take it from here, basically. We'll take, we'll, they said, we'll take it from here, Dr. Brandenburg. We don't want you working on this anymore. And don't try and get money from us to, to work on this anymore. And we can't tell you why, they said. <laughs> and I actually was very pleased. It was just like the string theory people getting angry with me for my unified field theory. I thought, yeah, okay, over target. You were over the target, right? I, I was, I was over target. At least fifty percent of the bombs fell within twenty-five uh, meters of the target. Like I said, when I was leaving Washington D.C. to go down to Kennedy Space Center to work at the Space Center, I was working for the state of Florida, Sp Florida Space Institute. You know, I asked permission to basically write a science fiction novel and they gave it to me they just said just make sure it's labeled science fiction john and so what came out was an elaborate war game of scenario of what a war with the grays would look like based on what i'd heard and i still think that's quite valuable and i like to think that people have read on the inside have read that and it's given them a lot of ideas now let's say the government comes out and they give the people enough information that they treat the greys as an enemy okay well they were described to me as a extraterrestrial threat whose existence is classified that's what they okay. were described to me as all right well let's say they say that, look they're they're a threat yes here are three possible options and we we're getting near the top of the hour so I i'm sorry yes yes so let's say one option is a demonstration of strength, which mass sightings all around the world all at once, but no harm. Second yeah. option is a more aggressive demonstration, like the atomization of an aircraft carrier. Or third, they double down on the deception, if true, right? If all this is true, and they come out with the like a I come in peace marketing campaign worldwide. <laughs> which which of the three, based on the you know intel that you have, would you think they would go? Or it could be a fourth scenario that I didn't mention. I think the first one is more likely they will try to because they've done this before. They've had waves of UFO sightings and even flown overflow in the Capitol. And they kept doing that till somebody they, they jet fighters actually came up and started shooting at them. Then they quit doing that, interestingly enough. Uh, so I think that is more likely. I think there's a movie called Earth versus the Flying Saucers where they take out a destroyer to sign to send a message to the government. But it just makes the government even more determined to fight them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so then given the legacy and the number of people who believe they've been abducted and abused by these people, plus the animal mutilations and human mutilations that are being kept under they're wraps. never discussed yeah there's they're never discussed people. but i have it on good authority yes there have been a number of human mutilations matching well, the same by, by, by the way i'm going to give another guy that i interviewed 
prior. If you want to learn all about that, there's a a website called badaliens.info, and you can Good. see all sorts of things. Yeah. Good. When I first started saying, you know, that the alien activities, uh, the greys, you know, the main culprit, were doing these sorts of things as classic, if they were human beings, this is classic terrorization and intimidation. Wow. And, oh, people were very upset with me for saying this. They can't, the Space Brothers, they can't be doing that. And now everybody... Yeah, it's like everybody's Stockholm coming. Syndrome. It's like, it's Stockholm, like Stockholm Syndrome. syndrome. Right. You know, and so I think option one, they will try and go with shock and awe with just a bunch of overflights of cities and maybe even broadcasts saying we, you know, that they may throw in a little bit of option three. We come in peace. And they'll quote Al Capone saying, we're just businessmen. Just give us what we want. Yeah, we're just explorers. We're just peaceful. Explorers. We're just we're just exploring. And there's a great movie, The Mysterians. Everyone should watch it. And that's what the Mysterians do. They just fly over yeah, Tokyo. Because here's the thing. If they wanted to unveil themselves, there's nothing our government could do to stop them. No. And they haven't. Why is that? Like So it's, they're hiding it, uh, the secret just as much as the government's hiding the secret. The secret is to their benefit right now because it gives them freedom of action. If the government was doing combat air patrols all over the country, you know, with uh, Air Force and National Guard fighters flying all over with magnetometers and good radars. You know, the new radars pick them up a lot better, apparently, than the old radars. And so it starts making their life very miserable, especially if they keep trying to do abductions and animal mutilations. Imagine risking a billion-dollar spaceship to mutilate a cow, you know, (laughs) In my, in my novel, by the way, the UFO cover-up people offer the aliens repeatedly, we'll give you all the cow parts you want. And the alien response to the UFO cover-up people who are running the UFO cover-up is, we don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, of course, of course. Any final words? <laughs> We're not interested in your cows, you know? And so they continue doing these animal mutilations, even though it just makes the ranchers mad. You know, it doesn't terrify the ranchers. It makes them mad. But anyway, okay, so of your three options, I think the first one is the cheapest and the least likely to lead to a actual shooting incident. However, if the government is determined to match any overflights like of cities with masses of jet fighters pursuing them, then that could very easily turn into a war in the sky. And in other words, the ante will suddenly, if you want to stay in this game, you got to put $100 on the table instead of five. You know, that's what the message would be. Any final words for the audience? I would just say the saying from my old graduate advisor, Abe Goldberg, who kept me in graduate school so I could finish. He said, God passes C students. I believe that uh, the human race is a bunch of C students, but I believe we will get through this thing. We'll do okay, and we have friends out there, and we'll join an enlightened community of civilizations out there, and our future will look like Star Trek. That's what I believe. I believe that with all my heart. All right. Well, thank you, my friend. And John, thank you. It's been a great pleasure being on your show. If you enjoyed today's video, please hit like and subscribe and also hit the notification button so you can be notified whenever I post new content. Thank you. Now, if you're enjoying the channel and you want to support it, there are several things you can do. In fact, there are five things you can do. The first thing you can do is just buy my books. I got plenty of books out in the market right now and I would prefer that folks buy a book rather than giving me direct support because they get something out of it. They have a real tangible product. The second way you can support me is by becoming a member on YouTube or becoming a patron on Patreon. And just go to either site and it'll explain everything.
The third way you can support the channel is by checking out my merch site, which is here. There's plenty of stuff that you can get to support the channel. And I'd appreciate that you, you have it and can wear it. Not only do you help support the channel, but you also help promote the channel, and I appreciate that. The fourth way that you can support the channel, and this is really easy, is anytime you want to buy something on Amazon, literally just go to the description below and click on any link, literally any link. The channel gets a cut of that, and it costs you no extra money. You just go through the link as I'm part of the Amazon Affiliates Club. The fifth and final way you can support the channel is through donations. Now, I don't prefer these because it's more of a expression of gratitude, but you don't really get anything out of it as a subscriber to the channel. However, if you decide to do these options, there's two options. There's Buy Me A Coffee, which is a separate site. And there's also, you can go through YouTube with either a Super Chat, a Super Sticker, or a Super Thanks. Again, I prefer Buy Me A Coffee because that organization takes less money than Amazon does. But either way, I appreciate any support you are willing to give the channel. So thank you very much and keep watching. I really appreciate it.